Pierre Agostini is um, from the Ohio State University. So please welcome, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Agostini. Um, Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, okay, the title of my talk is the genesis, the genesis of an atosecond pulse train. Uh, uh, it has nothing to do with trains, but uh, uh, we'll see. Um, okay, if some of you have never heard the word atosecond uh, before. We, it's a very short time. It's uh, a billions of a billions of a, a second. And, uh, uh, so one question, one natural question that could, could arise is, uh, is this series of, you know, from second to uh, nanoseconds and femtoseconds and attoseconds and more uh, is infinite. Uh, is it possible that to, div to divide the time infinitely like that? Um, from a physics point of view, I would say that that's doubtful because first of all, it takes more and more energy to produce those short pulses. And uh, at the end, uh, we'll hit the Planck time, and that's an absolute limit. Uh, we are still very far from that time, but it's probable that, OK, the series is not infinite, and you cannot divide the time indefinitely. So, uh, in this lecture, I would like to tell you about the physics of rabbit, and then I will tell you about uh, an application of uh, uh, those attosecond power strains, and uh, especially uh, uh, time application on double ionization. Okay, uh, it's quite obvious that if you need uh, to make an attosecond, then you need two things. First of all, you need a very short uh, period for the light. And uh, uh, this means high frequency, and this means uh, that you have to go into a domain which is soft X-ray and uh, XUV or soft X-rays. Uh, then what you need is a coherent bandwidth which is large enough to support the attosecond pulses. And uh, uh, this is a condition that must be fulfilled in, uh, so uh, the harmonics that Anne Lullier <laughs> talked about before is, or seems to be a perfect candidate to produce uh, those pulses. First of all, uh, the frequency is high, and it can be up to 100 times the uh, infrared frequency of the lasers. And then the bandwidth is f quickly very wide, and so all uh, the qualities are supposed to be here. So uh, indeed, back in 1992, those two guys, uh, my old friend Farkash, Kyozo Farkash, and uh, his co-workers, uh, thought, uh, Chabad thought, uh, calculated that if those harmonics 
are in phase. If they are phase locked, it's uh, say. And uh, uh, then in the time domain, that would correspond to a sequence of periodic pulses of very short duration. Uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> at that time, uh, this calculation by Anne Villiers and, and uh, co worker uh, seems to show that the phase were not at all <laughs> as hoped, but there was looking like uh, random, uh, absolutely random, and uh, so except perhaps in the, in the um, the cutoff region where there are no photons at all. So, yeah, uh, I come back to this question a bit later. Okay, then I have to introduce you to the above threshold ionization uh, process. And for that, I will start with uh, yeah, Einstein photo effect. Uh, that was mentioned already. So uh, Einstein has the idea that light is made of photons uh, and not of a field, but of photons. And uh, the photons have a specific and definite energy of H nu, the product of uh, the Planck constant by the frequency. Uh, so, an electron can absorb or emit uh, photons, okay, integer energy of photons. And now, if the photon energy is large enough, then you can liberate, you can free one electron from the, uh, the potential well in, in which it is. Okay? So, uh, this is well known from all the students and the, and the high school students, I guess. Uh, the, uh, uh, the kinetic energy of the electron which is freed is the difference between the photon energy, H nu, and uh, the, the uh, potential energy the electron is kept by uh, in the atom or in the solid or anything. All right, uh, then uh, that was uh, the time of Einstein, 1905. But uh, in the 60s, uh, in 61, uh, the, the laser was invented by Mehman and uh, uh, actually, uh, it was possible to ionize an atom with photons which were smaller than IP. And then you just had to pile up a number of photons. For instance, here, uh, the, 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 the kinetic energy is equal to 3H nu minus IP uh, on, on this uh, graphic. Uh, so the, the, the study of this MPI, so-called MPI, multi-photon ionization, uh, started in Russia at the Lebedev Institute, in the, and there are a number of papers from the mid-60s about that. Okay, and then I come to uh, uh, to the, the above threshold ionization or ATI, and it was, you know, uh, by measuring the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, it was uh, immediately seen that electrons are more energy than uh, than uh, predicted by uh, the Einstein photo effect, and by uh, the, the uh, energy of the electrons could be uh, that energy, minimum 3 H2 minus IP, for instance, in this case, plus another photon or two other photons. So uh, you could see that as, uh, as peaks in uh, 
the photoelectron spectra. So, uh, how to measure the phase? Uh, the phase of the harmonics is the, the, uh, the thing that uh, is the key uh, to attosecond pulses. And uh, so, how to measure the, those phases? First of all, you need a nonlinear optics process. Uh, I'm not showing, proving that here, but I ask you to take my word for it. Uh, so, uh, the problem was that harmonics were not strong enough to, uh, uh, to do those uh, multi photon or nonlinear optics processes. So, the solution was to mix, to mix the harmonics with a strong laser, and uh, uh, this would, could result easily in, in two-photon ATI or two-photon uh, ionization. So, uh, we have now this case of two-color, two-photon transition. Uh, uh, one is uh, with a harmonic or with a, a photon which is large enough, and then we have ATI, that is the, the, the atom absorbs one photon more, but one photon from the strong laser. So, uh, we could have also more complicated things like that, uh, where uh, we have three colors to start from, the two, two consecutive order harmonics, and one photon being absorbed and one photon being emitted. All right, that's the key of the measurements we have done. And uh, in 1996, uh, those three theorists from Paris, uh, Vignard, Tayeb, and Mackay uh, calculated that uh, in, if you have an atom which is ionized by uh, two colors to start from, right, two consecutive order harmonics, then you should have two peaks, uh, one for each of these colors, and if you mix those two colors with a laser, then the atom can absorb two photons, yeah, one photon uh, from harmonics and one, harmony, one laser photon, or absorb one bigger pho photon from the harmonics and emits one photon. And since we know that those harmonics are only uh, odd order harmonics. They are separated by twice the uh, laser frequency, twice the frequency omega. And uh, if uh, one absorbs one photon laser from the laser and the other emits one photon from the laser, you add it up to the same energy. Uh, and uh, this energy, this uh, gives rise, of course, to an interference. And, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm sorry for the equation, but uh, uh, the, the result of this interference is that the amplitude of the middle peak, which is called the sideband, is uh, given by uh, uh, this simple uh, uh, mathematical formula. And in this formula, uh, the frequency is uh, the frequency at which uh, these sidebands oscillate. And, uh, the, the, the phase difference, which is the thing that we are looking at, uh, looking for, is, is this factor here, delta phi, phi, phi q. Uh, and uh, so it's enough to change 
the delay and measure uh, the uh, amplitude of the sidebands to determine what the delta phi q is and uh, uh, to determine the phase of the harmonics or the phase difference of the harmonics and uh, uh, to check if we, whether or not uh, we have at a second pulses. Uh, on, on top of this delta phi q, uh, we, there is a small correction uh, that had to be calculated at the, at the time, and um, I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Okay. Uh, how do we implement the theory uh, in an experiment? Okay, this is, uh, uh, I'm not going to into all the details here, but the important thing was a mask, which was uh, uh, dividing the beam, the initial beam into two parts. Uh, then we had a couple of glass windows, uh, which, could be oriented and which introduced between the two beams uh, an attosecond delay, an attosecond, uh, a delay with attosecond precision. Uh, then there is, of course, uh, the jet where the harmonics are created. And then there is uh, something which I called here a pinhole, which is just <laughs> a hole in a piece of. Uh, of uh, metal, and uh, this has a very important role, as we will see immediately. Okay, uh, this is uh, the first measurement of uh, the harmonic phases in, in our experiment 20 years ago, and uh, so what you see here is uh, the spectrum uh, on, the, uh, on the top box, a uh, spectrum with no infrared, without this uh, laser photons. And so what you see are the peaks corresponding to the harmonics. Okay, then we introduce the laser, we superpose the laser to this harmonic beam, and we have more peaks in, in the... Uh, uh, in the spectrum, and uh, those are the sidebands in between each of the initial initial peaks, and the amplitude of the sidebands changes with uh, uh, with the delay. All right. So uh, once we have that, we have we can plot uh, the different sidebands that we see on the spectrum as a function of the delay, and uh, uh, we see oscillations as predicted by the, uh, the, the mathematical formula of uh, Vignard, uh, Taieb, Mackey, and from these oscillations one can derive the phase of the harmonics, the phase that was that would decide whether or not we have uh, at a second. So it turns out that uh, from this uh, from these phases, the phases are very well behaved. Uh, not at all the random things that was predicted by Antoine uh, and. Uh, and, and uh, match uh, but uh, from the uh, amplitude measurements and from the phases measurement, then one can reconstruct the time domain of the of the pulses of the light, and uh, we had uh, this uh, this. Uh, train, I mean train meaning here, a uh, sequence of periodic pulses, and uh, the, time, the, the, the pulse duration was 
at that time something like uh, 200 uh, attoseconds. That's much longer than, okay, that was 20 years ago, right? Now, uh, uh, probably uh, Ferenc will talk about that, but uh, uh, the pulses have shrank to 43 at a second, right? Uh, I think uh, that's the last number I, I saw. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, the question is, does this, that's the calculation of add that we saw a moment ago, uh, contra contradict that, uh, I mean, this, uh, this behavior which look completely random, and this one looks uh, pretty nice, so uh, is there a contradiction between the two? Uh, okay, I'm not uh, going to talk about the details which uh, have been already described by Anne, but the question is this angular distribution of the two uh, amplitude that interfere and that make uh, the uh, uh, the phases look absolutely random uh, then can be really solved with uh, a very small <laughs> and cheap things which is uh, probably uh, the cheapest thing in our experimental setup. And uh, so this is a pinhole that isolates one of the two amplitudes that creates the, the problem uh, with, the, with the, the randomness of the phases. So uh, the, this is done by just because of the angular distribution is different. And if uh, we put somewhere in the beam uh, uh, this very simple gadget of uh, uh, a pinhole, then this suppresses completely one of the interference uh, amplitude. And uh, from there, uh, uh, the, if the interference is suppressed, then the behavior of the phase is fine. Uh, one word about the, sm the small correction. You remember, perhaps, there are two terms, the, f the harmonic phase difference, and there was this small correction. Uh, the small correction has made a terrific career in the past 10 years or so uh, under the name of uh, photoionization delay. That's the technique that was used uh, to measure the time delay between, uh, uh, I mean, the time delay taken for uh, the electrons to be uh, removed in a photoionization process. Uh, well, I put some uh, titles there, but you can see in the, in the last one that, okay, uh, in one title, there is already Zepto second <laughs> coming, so the future is coming here. Okay, uh, now uh, I guess I have a few pictures that have been provided by Philippe Balcou of the laser we use at that time. Uh, that's not much of a picture, but uh, at least I've been guaranteed that is authentic. Uh, okay, uh, those are the two windows that were uh, used in the experiment and in the setup that we use to uh, uh, to control the, the, the delay between uh, the two beams. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's, yeah, uh, the two windows, this is a window clearly uh, on the left. On the right, there is a, a small 
part of the window, the small central part is the window, which has exactly the same thickness as the other one, because uh, it has been taken ex from the other one. And uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, this is again a, a courtesy of uh, Philippe Balcou, uh, and Amel Zahir, and the CNRS, and Celia. Um, so this is not really the, f the usual, the, the, uh, the authentic one, the, uh, the old one, which have disappeared, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it is uh, a replica which is exactly the same and which has been actually used in, in an experiment. Um, so, uh, I like to show some picture of the, the, the our students at the time. I mean, Elena, Thomas, and Pierre, Marie Paul, which uh, were, I think, in the audience somewhere. Uh, uh, Philippe Balcou uh, is here. This has uh, provided a number of things, and. Uh, one special mention is about Arm um, Miller, Professor Miller, who not only invented this setup that we have used in the experiment, but also invented this wonderful uh, acronym of RABBIT, uh, uh, whose explanation is, is uh, in the title of this paper, which came out um, one year after the first one, and is a uh, uh, reconstruction of attosecond harmonic beat by interference of two photon transition. Okay, then you know everything. <coughs> okay. Uh, then I would like to talk a little bit about an application. And, uh, the, the, the subject of this second part is the strong field double ionization. Okay, first I could show you, okay, that's show and tell. Uh, uh, a modern atom beam line in, at, at Ohio State. Uh, so uh, you see tube tubing, and uh, well, you, the the, um, uh, the the electron spectrometer is down there. Uh, the laser is somewhere in another room, and so the laser beam is coming through those tubes. Uh, the, the, it's under vacuum. Everything is under vacuum because all those harmonics are XUV or. Uh, um, uh, XUV uh, or uh, yeah, soft X-rays. So uh, naturally now everything is automat automatic. The, in the first experiment we were, I mean, we are turning the glasses by hand to start from. So yeah, uh, all the time. Um, uh, now it's completely automatic and. and uh, what you see here is a, a sequence of measurements, and first of all, the laser are kilohertz repetition rate, so it's much more uh, accurate and, uh, and precise now. Okay, so uh, double ionization. I mean, once you have extracted one electron for an atom, so you have an ion, and if you try to extract the second electron, then the, 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 uh, the work you have to apply to the atom is about twice uh, the, the first one. So uh, it's predicted from that that it would be much more difficult to extract the second electron than to extract the first one. But OK. An experiment of several experiments in the 1940, in the 1924, uh, showed that this was not at all uh, the case, and uh, uh, that uh, ionization of a double ionization was not 
that difficult. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the explanations was provided by uh, those guys. I mean, uh, Paul Korkum, Ken Kulander, and Ken Schaefer. Ken Schaefer is here somewhere. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, if, you, if you extract one electron in the presence of a strong field, this electron can uh, be accelerated by the field and then uh, right, step back to the nucleus where it started from and extract another electron by a yeah, E2E process by uh, uh, s sort of uh, billiard balls, right? Uh, so the probability of this element is, is much larger than uh, what expected by, uh, say, multi-photon multi processes, uh, perturbative multi-photon processes. Okay, uh, now the experiment that uh, will be has been done in, in Columbus uh, at Ohio State uh, by uh, those students at, and under the direction of uh, Lou DiMauro uh, is, is the following. Okay, first we have this strain of atosecond pulses that we can, you know, absolutely precisely delay with um, respect to the uh, to the the, uh, the the optical cycle of the of the laser, so we can decide exactly at what what moment, at what time, uh, within the attosecond pulse duration, uh, the electron will be ejected, and then we can detect or observe. Uh, the return time that of these electrons, the time that uh, uh, separates the emission from uh, its return to the to the nucleus, uh, by observing the doubly charged ions, and uh, from the knowledge of the, dip, the, the departure time and the return time, we can. Uh, we can uh, reconstruct the electron motion exactly. Uh, so that's one example of how you can use those atosecond pulses to uh, control and, and observe electrons motion uh, in, in, a, in a strong field. Just yeah, a quick look towards the future. Uh, so far, all uh, attosecond pulses are uh, created by a laser, a visible or infrared laser, and uh, uh, harmonics. Now, uh, the problem with the harmonics is that they are not very powerful. I mean, they are sort of weak. And to observe nonlinear processes with them, we have to mix them with a strong laser. Now, uh, at the LINAC light, light uh, coherent light source, uh, X-ray free electron lasers, which is this, uh, <laughs> this small setup of uh, one kilometer long or something, uh, I'm finished. Uh, um, uh, people have already found that they are able to create atosecond, isolated atosecond pulses with gigawatt peak power. So that's at least a factor 10 above the current harmonics uh, at the moment. So maybe the future of the, the atosecond is not in the lab and uh, not uh, with our laser and harmonics, but with this uh, LCLS uh, X-ray free electron laser. Okay, thank you.